Hello and welcome to A Closer Look with Mark Miller and Mark Shine. And Mark, we are heavy into basketball season now. League play is uh, really rolling. Lots of doubleheader weekends. Great games. Yeah, great games. This is a great time of year because kids get into a routine now. I know we're going to have some weather situations that will take some games out. But now they get into a routine of when their games are going to be, when they can practice, and kids perform better that way. Hey, we're going to flip it up a little bit this week because Mark always has a couple of rules that he discusses. He's going to switch that this time and give us some questions right. for you to think about during the show. So we're going to put four questions up on the screen here and give you a chance to think about them through the course of the show. Then we'll answer them when we get down into section number three. All right, so you're the free throw shooter. Somebody, the referee bounces you to basketball. How long do you have to take before you had must shoot to basketball? You're closely guarded, okay? So you catch the ball. How long can you hold it? and then dribble it, and then hold it again before you have to get rid of it. And then uh, when you get uh, a team takes the basketball out of bounds, how long do you have to throw it in and have a teammate touch it uh, to be legal? And then finally, and this is kind of one of those fun little things, there's something every official is supposed to carry in his pocket. It's not lip balm, but what is it? It's a Kit Kat bar. It's a Kit Kat bar. That <laughs> would be a good I thing. Think. All right, so we're going to answer those in segment three. All right, well, let's review some games from last weekend, and Mark's going to start it off with Crestview and Jefferson. All right, Crestview and Jefferson. This is an NWC game, a Northwest Conference game. Crestview will become the first team in the conference to get to three conference wins with a 58-50 win over Jefferson. They'll take a nice lead in this game. They'll go up 34-21 at half. Jefferson whittles away in the second half by outscoring Crestview 29-25 but not enough, and Crestview will come out with that eight-point win. Balanced scoring for the Knights. They have Wade Sheets with 16, Derek Stout with 16, Javon Etzler with 13. Jefferson got to 13 from Hunter Miracle, 11 each from Alex Rohde and Tyler Bratton. Crestview will also beat Miller City on Monday night, 63-47. So Crestview off to a good start, 3-0 in conference play, winning some non-conference games too. Let's go to the WBL. Shawnee 49, Wapak 42. This was 27 all at halftime. Shawnee with the win goes to 9 and 2 overall having a really good year. 2 and 0 in the WBL. Sheridan O'Neill led them with 19 points and 8 rebounds. On Saturday they came right back and beat Coldwater to give them 7 wins in a row. Walpock 7 and 3 now 1 and 1 in league play. Adam Scott had 18 points, 6 rebounds and Jace Copeland had 9 points, 3 threes. He really came out firing and got them off to a good start, but in the second half, Wapak went cold with their shooting and ended up losing that thing by seven. Wouldn't you think, Mark, when we saw that score, we were up at Defiance the other night, we said, you know what, if, if it's a low scoring game, that favors Wapak, but Shawnee's able to win one at Wapak's pace. They're playing very that? well right now. All right, let's move on to St. Henry 59 and Fort Recovery 47. This was an important game in the NAC because each team had a conference loss coming into this game. Third quarter, it's all St. Henry, 14 to four, and the fourth quarter, even more so, 28-14. St. Henry wins the second half over Fort Recovery, 42-18. Tyler Farmer, what a year he's having, 27 points made, six threes. Caden Niekamp, Caden Niekamp chipped in with 11. They came back to St. Henry on Saturday night with a 56-42 win over Bass. Schlarman had 18 again. The two Niekamps had 18 and 12, or excuse me, 10 and 12, and Fort Recovery came back with a win over Lincoln View to get to six and three on the season. Let's look at a couple of afternoon games. On Saturday afternoon, Perry 60, LCC 54. It's a cross county shootout. It's gonna be an annual event that'll be pretty cool. Perry with the win goes to five and six. This is their first win ever in school history over LCC. Last time they played was in 1990 in a sectional tournament game and LCC won by three, 60-57. Perry was down 32-23 at the half, but Logan Dre had 27 points, including five threes, and helped the Commodores come back for that victory. For LCC, Matthew Sakela led them with 14 points. He also had four threes. Then on Sunday afternoon, LCC comes back and they play Delphi St. John's. They lost another close one, two close losses in the same weekend. This one in double overtime, 48-46. DSJ's six and four now. Connor Houlihan scored the first nine points of the game and he scored the very last basket of the game. That was it. That's his points for the game. <laughs> Colin Will led them in 13 with 13 points. They led most of the game for LCC, now four and seven. Ron Banks had 14. They made last second shots to force overtime out of regulation and to force the game into two overtimes. Could not win it at the end of that, however, and ended up with a tough weekend on two good games. Let's move to a PCL matchup, Pandora Gilboa and Miller City. If you look at both of these teams coming into the game, you think well, this is going to be a very high scoring game. That was not the case as PG really clamped down on Miller City for a 44-42 win. 
Miller City came into the game averaging 64.1 points per game through their first nine. There was 1-0 in conference play, but PG had a really nice basketball game. Uh, not many points, of course, from Drew Johnson, just six. On Friday night, he became the school's all-time leading scoring leader. He had the, went over the 12,000 1,228-point mark set by Josh Lee back in 2010. Just six points in this game for him, but 10 rebounds. Cooper McCullough had 13 along with three threes, and Mark Kuhlman had 17 to lead Miller City and also nine rebounds. PG now leads two different conferences, the PCL at 3-0 and the BBC at 4-0. Having a good year? Yes, sir. Hey, let's look at some of the other stat stuffers we had. I got the first one, Marcus Bruns from Coldwater. He had 20 points, including one three against New Knoxville on Friday night, came back on Saturday night against St. Henry, had 24 points and four threes. All right, we talked about Fort Recovery a little bit earlier. They split the weekend with a loss to St. Henry and a win over Lincoln View, but Peyton Judy continues to have a great year for them. 21 points and a couple of three balls against St. Henry, then 33 and a single three ball against Lincoln View. And you go, yeah, sometimes guys get 33 and they're kind of padding their stats. Well, they won by five, so every one of those 33 points were important. Peyton Judy having a good year for Fort Recovery. And he earned them with only one three, huh? Yes, he did. Hey, Wyatt Daniels from Upper Scioto Valley, 32 points and seven threes, yeah. including six rebounds, three steals against Ridgemont. That's a full That's night nice. there. Came back against Ben Logan the next night, had 20.7 rebounds and six assists. That's all around games there. Yeah, he's playing really well for those guys. USD's on a roll right now. Let's look at Shawnee. Mark mentioned them earlier. Johnny Capella had 30 against Coldwater in that particular basketball game, lead them in scoring. But the guy who has really picked it up for them recently and really come around, Sheridan O'Neill, over the last three weeks, really been playing well in this game against Coldwater. 17 points, six rebounds, four assists, and three blocks. Of course, they beat Wapak on Friday night, and Shawnee's on a roll right now. Brody Bowman, we talk about him almost every week from Temple. 25 points, had three threes against Waynesfield. The next night had 20 points and two more threes against Allen East. He's playing very well. He's one of those guys we saw right there in the move. He really knows how to work that free throw line area and get his jump shot. Let's move on to Matthew Ayers from Van Buren. Van Buren with a couple of wins over the weekend. They defeated Liberty Benton on Friday. Matthew Ayers had 21 and a couple of three balls. They came back, he came back with 24 on Saturday night and four threes against Patrick Henry. Man, Van Buren graduated those guys from a year ago, but playing well right now and chasing PG in the conference right now. Katie Hempling from Ottawa Glandorf. Congratulations to her and their game against Bath this weekend, or this week, she went over a thousand points for her career. And what I'm happy about, she's committed to my alma mater, BG. And she's one of those all around players. You can talk about that oh, thousand points, but she yeah. can do a lot of things for them too. And one other thing we want to mention from the ladies standpoint, and that is Adam Huber, our friend up at Kaleida, athletic director and also ladies basketball coach. Adam got his hundredth win of his high school coaching career with a win over Wapak on Saturday afternoon getting some of those milestones there coming our way. Yes, we'll have sir. more for you next weekend, yep. I think. Hey, let's look at our where are they now, the where are the college players that are at. We're gonna look at two Elida guys. The first one we're gonna look at is Austin Allmeyer. Austin's a six foot two sophomore, currently at Ohio Northern University, graduated from Elida in 2015. He was an all WBL performer. Now at Northern, he has started all 13 games this year, playing 26 and a half minutes a game, averaging four points, three rebounds, two and a half assists, does a little bit of everything. Had a season high of 10 points against Lynchburg, and they told you that he adds energy and defense to this yeah, team. Yeah, Coach was interviewed on the radio the other night and said that you know, he is an energy guy and he is their best defensive player, and he's really found a role over there at uh, Ohio North. You don't need to just score points to be valuable, and he's proven that. Well, he'll get in the, on the floor if he can do those things. The, how Northern right now standing at nine and four, four and two in the OAC, which is good to tie them for third place. And then the other guy we want to highlight is Dakota Mathias. Dakota's a six foot four senior currently at Purdue at Elada High School. He graduated in 14. He was a WBL Player of the Year, Division II All-State first team. His senior year, he averaged 28 points, eight rebounds, six assists. He had 63 threes. He played on that state runner-up team as a sophomore, but now at Purdue, in the midst of his fourth year of lettering, they are 15-2, 4-0 in the Big Ten, tied with the Buckeyes for first place. They are 57-6 at home during his career. That is amazing. He's a two-time academic All-Big Ten choice. Last year he made the All-Big Ten defensive team in this season, averaging 13.3 points, four rebounds, four and a half assists. He has 197 career threes. 243 is a record, he's got a chance but even more impressive, he has hit a three in 23 straight games. That's a record. 
Those two guys doing a great job in college, both from Elida. Yeah, they are. How about the seasons that Dakota Mathias have with his team? He was one of the smartest high school players I ever saw. He just knew what was going on the floor all the time. Great guy. Okay, the next thing we want to turn to is our bright spot. And I get to go first. We came up upon this picture. I found it actually on a secretary's desk. This little fella, his dad is an assistant athletic director at the University of Toledo. And the Toledo Blade photographer, or some newspaper, or some photographer somewhere, took a picture of him during the national anthem. And that just caught our attention because of all the emphasis Mark and I and the station and WSN has put on the national anthem protocol. And that little guy has it right. Doesn't he hand over the heart? Looking up at that big flag, that is a precious picture. Good job. You can tell his dad has done a good job Absolutely. with him. Absolutely. You know, Mark, we talked about January 19th as Military Appreciation Night. If your school hasn't got something planned yet, let's get on the stick and get that going on, on January 19th. There you go. All right. And we also had an opportunity. Mark and I were at Defiance the other night as they opened up their new high school and new facility for basketball. And we had a chance to interview their superintendent, Mike Strubel. We wanted to play that interview for you right now. All right, we are back at the gymnasium at Defiance High School, the brand new Defiance High School. And with us is Superintendent Mike Struble. Mike, thanks for joining us. Hey, we got a little bit of a tour of the school and we've heard a lot about it. We watched your, your drone cams or whatever those things are. And we are excited to be here and I know you guys are really excited. What a great project. You wanna just kind of lead in and tell us about how it went and mid-year moves are never easy, but you're sure, in it. Sure, sure. Uh, the bond issue, it seemed like it passed uh, 10 years ago, but it was uh, May of 14, the community blessed us by passing that bond issue, and we, and we were determined that we were going to make this uh, great educational facility for our kids. And, and boy, our, our whole construction team really came through. The technology in this place is unbelievable. I mean, uh, we've got smart boards, and I mean they're really smart. I, I, I hope we're smart enough, uh, you know, but it, it allows teachers to... Uh, uh, you know, use their computer and communicate with the students. And, and uh, of course, we can vid live video stream and, and things like that. And uh, uh, all of our science rooms have uh, monitors so that the, they can do simulated dissections and things like that. So uh, I graduated from high school in 1969, so all of this is, uh -huh. uh, you know, science fiction to me. But uh, uh -huh. I think it's fantastic. Uh, for our kids. Well, Mike, everybody else was enjoying a Christmas break, but you and your staff, you're working the last two weeks trying to get ready for school this past e Wednesday. Yes, our maintenance and uh, custodial staff and our teachers, uh, uh, they were excited about coming into the facility, so they worked uh, double time. They they were here every day over uh, Christmas break, and I, and I give them a lot of credit for that, and it, it was cold. It wasn't an easy, <laughs> wasn't an easy move, but, uh, uh, you know, everybody came through, and, and we met the schedule, and uh, uh, I just couldn't be more pleased with our staff. Well, every time we come to Defiance, the staff is very friendly. The students have great enthusiasm, but moving into a new building has to take all of that to a different level, doesn't it? They were excited. Uh, some of the kids said it was like uh, taking a field trip because everything was new yeah. to them. They, you know, they really didn't have much of a chance. They got to see the building one day before we actually oh. got into it, so they were extremely excited. and. Uh, uh, you, you know, that, that's the most fulfilling thing for me as a school administrator to open a building because the excitement of the kids and uh, how this motivates them, it, uh, it just makes everything worthwhile. Well, Mike, when we came in, they took us to the wrestling room, which is not quite done yet. So where are you in your project? Are, are, how close are you to being done? We're, we're probably 90% done. They just finished the track today. They still have to stripe the track up here. Uh, this is an eighth, eighth of a mile track. And then the wrestling room, uh, they're going to install on January 8th, on Monday. Uh, so the wrestling room will be, be done within a couple of days. Uh, we've got little things, like we've got a couple of countertops that didn't show up. Every, every new school has a punch list, which is things that uh, have been omitted or, or not completed or, or something like that. And we'll be working through that, you know, maybe for a couple of months. But the academic area and the, and the commons area, the cafeteria, everything functions just great so far. So uh, uh, we're about 90% done, and I'm just happy that we got in on time. Yeah, you bet. Well, we're in the gymnasium. We're here for basketball. It right. is a beautiful facility. Thank you. Talk a little bit about what, how you, why you built it the way you did. Sure. We, we've been told that certain things were seen at other gymnasiums sure. you liked and you sure. took the best go ahead and talk about the gym well i don't like cookie cutter box gyms so uh we we, we took some of a, a little bit of everything that we saw from other gyms that we like the sullivan center at toledo central catholic uh hamilton city schools has a gym almost identical to this mm -hmm. uh we looked at kettering uh fairmont east and west merged and it's now kettering 
high school, they have a gymnasium like this. Of course, we always liked the Stroh Center, so we incorporated things like this. Now, I'm an old-timer, so those corner scoreboards are in honor of St. John Arena. Yeah. We and, love them. And, right. We love them. <laughs> yeah. You know, we wanted to have a little character in, in the gymnasium, and we thought, you know, the community, Defiance College has uh, the, the Smart Center, and the community comes in and walks. So not only can the track benefit uh, athletics, but also uh, our senior citizens or, or community members, if they're uh, free during the day, they, uh, we're going to try to make this so that they can come in and walk and get a little bit of exercise. What's capacity so seating in here? Uh, 2,500. Oh, uh, the old gym was 1,900, but we love to host tournaments, and mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Beauty, our athletic director, does a terrific job, and uh, the OHSAA has, al has already awarded us the D3 district wrestling, so uh, we love to have people come to Defiance. We like to host them. Uh, we're proud of our facility, and, and we're proud of our staff, and uh, uh, we want to put on a good show for the fans. Well, right. Mike, you and the people of Defiance should be very proud of your, what you've done here in the community. It's a great asset to, to your kids and your community. We appreciate you being on with us at halftime, and congratulations on what you did here. Thank you, gentlemen. We're happy that you're here. We'll be back with segment two. We're going to look at plays of the week in just a minute. Back with segment number two at the Big Board Plays of the Week. And Mark Shine, the plays of the week I've noticed aren't always a slam dunk or a dribble behind the back. You pick out plays for a variety of reasons. How, what are those reasons? Well, there's about three of them we try to look at, Mark. One of them is something that shows a, a team following a coach's plan, something that they've been diagrammed, something they've been taught, whether it's a set play or reaction to a situation. So that's one of them. The second is the play that maybe has a real impact on the game and turns things around or it's the game-winning shot or something like that. And the third thing kind of is that hustle play, that little extra thing going over and above and beyond the type of thing that we typically look at and, and just something for the fan to see that maybe the average person doesn't normally see. All right, well, Mark picked out several this week. We're going to start with some from the Lima Senior game. Well, this Lima Senior we saw the other night when they uh, were matched up uh, with Mansfield Senior. What we want to start out with first is a football term. You know the term throw them open, how oh, the, yeah. the, the quarterback, yep. and you did that for an entire career. Yep. I hope. Tried. Throwing guys <laughs> open. Well, that's what's going to happen right here because as we start this, the big guy in the post, Kaloon, doesn't even know he's open yet, and King says, yes, you are. Or, excuse me, that's um, uh, Miller. B.J. Miller says, yes, you are. You're open. And you don't even realize it yet. So let's take a look at this again. Here's up on top. This is Miller. He finds Cologne right on the box and says, son, you're open. Catch the ball and go to the rim. That's a point guard, in this case, B.J. Miller, saying, you're open. Go make a play. And then one of the things that we like, and that's the backdoor play in basketball, or the high-low play right here is the first one. This is a very nice high-low play. Once again, it's Miller. This time he's throwing the ball or catching the ball down in the low box. And if you saw a chance to see that, the catch was up on top. He did a nice job of holding his man off without that push-off foul and being able to score down low in the, in the low box. Well, this is the backdoor play from just a moment ago. And once again, we got Miller involved in this particular play, but it's all set up by the defense. You've got to get your defensive guy thinking out that the help is late, the power layup, and Jaleel King is that young man having a year. He is really a 6'4 junior who's really coming along for Lima Senior. And then... This is just a chance to look at that LCC play by Janowski. Here's a senior making the wise move. They're down at this particular point. The T-Birds the need a three. His teammate gets an off-balance three on one side of the floor, but he realizes, first of all, nobody checks him out as he goes right to the glass here. He rebounds. we got to have a three, so he goes back out to the arc, gets his shot up, and buries it. And you were at that particular game. Yeah. You can see the excitement. They made another shot right at the end of the, reg of the first overtime. And then finally, this play takes place, and this is the game winner for DSJ. This is going to be Connor Houlihan off a feed from Will, and there's the jumper out of the corner for two, but it's really set up by Will. If you watch him, he penetrates and forces the defense to guard him right here, and with that, Houlihan's man leaves him, has to right here, the kick out, and there's the shot out of the corner, game winner for DSJ. That's coaching right there. You're taught to go to the rim until somebody stops you. If they don't, you're going to go to the basket and score. If they do, you find your teammate and kick out. That's exactly what happened. And of course, Houlihan then makes the big shot. What? He made three baskets early or had nine points early. Yeah. Nothing for the rest of the basketball. Started off on fire, out. had their first nine points. And then he didn't take a lot of shots, yeah. missed a couple, but really didn't score until the very last basket of the game, which ended up being the biggest basket. Yeah, catch yeah. and feed from his teammate. And he sticks mm -hmm. the big jumper when it counted. Great Sunday afternoon basketball. 
All right, join us. We got one segment left. We'll be right back after this. All right, we are back for our final segment, and we're going to finally get the answers to those questions that Coach Shine put up at the first. So All right, right let's ahead. put the questions and the answers up on the screen. How long does a free throw shooter have to shoot? Well, from the time the referee bounces you the basketball, you have 10 seconds, and referees have been told to make a slightly discernible motion. So if you look at most officials while the uh, free throw is being shot, they'll be counting by opening their hand and closing their hand. you got 10 seconds to get that off. If you look at the closely guarded question, you can do each one for four seconds. So if you catch the basketball and you hold it while closely guarded, that's four seconds. You can then dribble it for four seconds, pick it up and hold it again. So it's actually a total of 12 seconds that you can maintain the basketball while being closely guarded if you do each of those three things. Then we got kind of a trick question here with number three. It says, how long do you have to touch the basketball once it's been inbounded? as long as you want. The rule book used to say you had to catch it or touch it within five seconds. Now the rule book simply says it must be out of the inbounder's hands within five seconds and as much time as you need to go and get it and retrieve it and put the ball in play. And then finally, what's every official supposed to carry in their pocket? A second whistle. Mm. Now I actually had a partner last year and, and we're going through this. We're on the court ready for a jump ball. He says, hey, let me have your extra whistle. I forgot mine. It's in the locker. And I said, I got my whistle. I don't have my second. He said, you're supposed to have two. And I said, well, you're supposed to have one. <laughs> so we had to delay while he ran down the locker room and got his whistle. But you're so supposed, to have a, supposed to have a second one in your pocket. Most of them don't, but you're supposed to. It really isn't a Kit Kat. Yeah, no, it's not a Kit Kat oh, bar. No, it's not. All right, we have some great games coming up like we do every week. Let's take a look at it. I've got the first one, and it's tonight. Fort Loramie, 10-0, at Versailles, 10-0. Some undefeated is going to leave the ranks tonight. Fort Loramie beat Rushi last week, 47-32. Rushi's won the last four SCAL championships, and oddly enough, Fort Loramie has lost the last two years in regular season to Rushi, but beat them in tournament. So this is a different kind of thing for them to win in the regular season. Versailles beat Parkway 70-46. Justin Arns, the OSU commit, had 29, including three threes. On Saturday, they beat Franklin Monroe 60 to 43. This will be a great midweek game. And then on Friday, we get for sales again. Yes, we do. Mark and I are headed down there. Yep. There are 3 0 in the MAC. They're going to play Marion Local, who's 5 3 overall, but 2 0 in the MAC. So it's for first place again. Of course, it's the Nick Schultz dinner night, so we're pretty <laughs> excited about that. A good buddy yeah. of ours down at Mar Maria Stein. This is a battle for first place in the MAC. Marion Local last week lost to Anna, 53-49. Tyler Mesher scored his thousandth point. Yeah, There's did. another there milestone, right? And Nathan Bruns is scoring a, uh, a lot as well. So two great tests for Versailles tonight and Friday. I'm a little jealous you get to do that game tonight. I'd like to be down there to see that, but that's a good middle of the week game. Okay, well, let's move on to uh, Ottawa Glendorf. They got a big weekend coming up. Uh, and along with Finley, I guess Finley is kind of our focus here right now. Ottawa Glendorf, 10 and 0. They play at Finley uh, this while Friday night on Saturday night, by the way. Um, Hegel is leading Ottawa Glendorf in scoring at 15.9. He's made 10 three-point field goals. Herringhouse has got uh, averaging about uh, 6.7 points per game, but he's their three-point shooter, and they've given up just 50 and a half points. Uh, has Ottawa Glendorf per game recently. Jay Kaufman's back in his six basketball games he's played so far. He's averaging 16 points. Made six three-point field goals. Since he's came back, Dybul's scoring has dropped off a little bit. He's down to just 9.8 uh, per game after averaging almost 13 through the first part of the season. Just so they get things worked out between the two of them, you'll know Dybul can score inside. If you look at who's winning this basketball game, Finley and OG, well, Finley's won three out of the last four, so that's kind of an interesting matchup right there. Well, if you're Finley, your weekend starts, though, with a big rivalry for people in our area, and that's with Lima Sr., Finley's 7-3 going into that game, 2-2 two two in conference play. The Spartans are 6-5. They are 3-2 in the track. Finley averages 57.6 points per game. They give up 47.3. And Ryan Roth leads them in scoring at 14.9. Ryan Nunn at 16.8. It's also their three-point shooter. And Jacob Logston at 13.8 over the last five games. He didn't play in the first five games. So they've now got three legitimate scores for Finley right now. And they're 7-3. 
two and two in conference play. Lima Senior, they've got some tough losses. A single point loss to St. Francis, a two point loss to Fremont Ross, a single point loss to Elida, so that's three losses by four points. And they're six and five right now, three and two in conference play. We saw them play the other night. Jaleel King averaging 16.1 points per game. They had 20.7 over the last three games. He's a flat out scorer. B.J. Miller's played well for them. We've got some highlights coming up. Uh, we showed you a moment ago we, uh, some of their backdoor plays, some things they're doing offensively. The thing with the Spartans is they've had so many guys hurt. A coach's decision not to play, illness, trying to find a set lineup for them. We got a new roster the other night with four different players on the roster. So things are kind of in turmoil right now with Lima Senior. See if they can get the winning streak going against Finley this week. Got another battle for first place, this time in the PCL. Ottoville, 11-2, 1-0 in the league at PG, 9-1, 3-0. Mark talked about PG a little bit earlier. Ottawa or Ottoville, 67-50 over Minster. My response was, wow. I yeah, didn't expect that's, that. That's right. Logan Kemper had 32 points and seven threes, and that's another wow. So that was a big, big win for Ottoville. PG beat Arlington 30 to 27 in a slowdown game when Drew Johnson had 14 and 11, went over 1,000 like Mark said, and then Saturday, another good win for them over Miller City, 44-42. Drew Johnson didn't score much, but Cooper McCullough stepped up with 13 points, and the question is, did those two close games get them ready for Ottoville? We'll find out this weekend. Should be a great battle. Well, there's another big game in the PCL this weekend. That's Fort Jennings at Kaleida. Fort Jennings and their new coach, Ryan Schrader. They're 7-3, 1-0 in conference play. They scored at 57.7. They gave up 51.4. Cole Horseman leads them at scoring at 15.8. Weary's at 12.9. Finn's just under 10. He's been averaging about 12.5 over their last five games. Um, so they're really playing well right now. Then they got three guys, Trentman, Recker, and Clausing, who just kind of take turns stepping up and making three balls. The three of them have made 27 threes over the course of the season, so they give a little bit of extra scoring in there and help out those three guys at the top. And then Kaleida, Ryan Steckshoulder. His team started six and two, or excuse me, two and two. They've won six in a row, including a couple of really close wins, an overtime win over Lima Central Catholic, and a three-point win over Lincoln View. They score a little less than they do over at Fort Jennings. Kaleida averages 50 points a game, but they give up just 40 points per game. And during the win streak, that's down to 37 points a game. Lambert at 13.7, Laudick at 10.0. Clausing's had a couple big games. I saw him have 23 in a win over a, a USV back before Christmas. Wrecker can score for them as well. So it's kind of one of those PCL games. Is it a shootout game? Is it a defensive game? We'll have to see what happens this week when Fort Jennings and Kaleida get together. Two big games in the PCL this week. Well, as if Versailles at Marion Local on Friday isn't enough for Mark and I. Yeah. We get to go down Saturday yes. and do St. Henry and Anna in another deep in Mac country battle. That's going to be a great game. Well, it's, you know, it's one of those games, the non-conference game, but it's one of those games that kind of establishes where are we at here in the middle of the month and uh, as we get into the middle part of January. And a non-conference game has some things to do with tournament seating a little bit later on and two proximity close teams and two good programs. And it's got some big wins lately. That'll be a really nice matchup. Yeah, they were losing the whole game to Marion Local and came back and got a win against a good flyer team. There you go. All right, let's put up our broadcast schedule. As always, Ben Reif and the crew put together a great schedule of games for us to replay and get to you. There we go, a girls basketball game, Bath and Ottoville. Boy, that's two great programs. Then the number one and number three game that we talked about being played tonight. And then again on Friday, Versailles and Marion Local battling it out for the MAC. Van Wert, OG, always a good battle. Van Wert plays OG tough every year on Saturday. A whole nother host of games coming your way. Some of the games we talked about, some others that we haven't. Even Sunday, Jackson Center, New Knoxville, and that St. Henry and a matchup that we talked about. So don't wonder what to do. <laughs> Just turn the TV on, WSN, WTLW. There will be great game replays. Don't forget to watch us over again a time or two. That's uh, another week in the wrap, Mark. It's go. good games. I can't great wait to see what happens. Up. Thank you for joining us on A Closer Look. We'll see you again next week.